What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Dr. Aubrey de Grey. He's a biomedical gerontologist who's the chief science officer and co-founder of SENS Research Foundation. You could find them at SENS.org. They work to extend the lifespan significantly. And to give you an idea, they believe the first person that will live to a thousand is alive today. I believe I'm accurate with that. You said that. He received a degree in computer science and PhD in biology from University of Cambridge. Dr. DeGray is editor-in-chief of Rejuvenation Research and sits on numerous scientific advisory boards. He's the author of the book, Ending Aging. And if you haven't seen his TED Talk, go check it out. Dr. DeGray, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show. I always like to include a fun fact that most people don't know about you because you have a lot of content and videos out there, something that maybe won't get you in trouble with your staff or your wife. And um, (laughs) one is... Your favorite way to relax. What's your favorite way to relax? Yeah, my, my favorite way to relax is looking at the stars in, in the night out of my hot tub that I have in the yard of my house. It's something that I only really discovered a couple of years ago because I didn't have a hot tub until then. And I can, I can dispel the day's in 10 minutes in my hot tub when it might take an hour by any other means. Nice, yeah. So, yeah, I want to find out where this all came from, but first I want to hear about some of the, what advancements and breakthroughs are you most excited about right now uh, with anti-aging? Well, it's actually quite hard to answer that question because as the chief scientist of a research foundation, uh, where we have a dozen different projects going on doing very different things, I'm kind of, you know, I'm exposed to progress all the time in all of these areas. And some of that progress is reasonably easy to describe to a non-specialist, but a lot of it is very technical, and I'm excited by it, but it would take me half an hour. To- <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, let me just give one example that's sure. reasonably easy to describe. About... Um, a couple of years ago now, uh, we made a massive breakthrough against atherosclerosis, which is the number one killer in the Western world. It's the thing that you have attacks and strokes. Um, we were able to break down the major toxic molecule that causes atherosclerosis an oxidized version of cholesterol called 7-ketocholesterol. And um, we, didn't, we didn't inject these bacteria into mice or anything like that. What we did was we found which genes and enzymes these bacteria were using to break down the nasty chemical. And we were able to introduce that gene into human cells, in cell culture. This was very tricky because human cells are very different from bacterial cells, so we had to tweak the gene a lot. But we got it working, and the result is that you can, you can take these cells now and give them a quantity of this nasty molecule that would be enough to kill most normal cells, and the cells that we have added this one gene to are fine. So, of course, we're pushing that forward as much as we can. We've actually spun it out to a private company, a startup company that was created for this purpose by one of our major donors. So, we're hoping that that's going to move in the direction of, um, (coughs) excuse me, in the direction of in vivo models and clinical trials pretty quickly now. Yeah. So, on a given time, how many different... Um, like research uh, advancements are you working on? 
not enough. <laughs> At the moment, it's, it's about a dozen. We have two major projects that we, we um, undertake in our research center here in Mountain View, California. And the rest of them are in university laboratories around the world, mostly in the USA. So we have one at Yale, we have one at Berkeley, we have one at Harvard, um, one at Rice, um, and uh, other prestigious institutions. But we have a considerable shopping list that we would like to do more projects on. Yeah. Um, you know, Aubrey, I want to hear about the Mouse Prize and how that okay. came about. Sure. So, first of all, I want to emphasize that Sense Research Foundation doesn't do prizes. That's a partner organization that we have called the Methuselah Foundation, mm -hmm. which was actually created first. I created the Methuselah Foundation jointly with a guy named Dave Goebel, a businessman from Virginia, who actually is still running the Methuselah Foundation, and they are responsible for these mouse prizes as well as for other more prizes that they created more recently in the field of tissue engineering. Right. The idea here is basically we started out, of course, back in 2002, 2003, with basically no money, so we couldn't fund research. All we could really do was PR. We could uh, try to increase the um, profile, improve the um, credibility of longevity research, and what we wanted to do, especially, was to appeal to people who are not naturally interested in science, people who are more excited by things like world records and prizes. So we created these prizes for anyone who could break the world record mouse longevity. Hmm. And um, nobody actually succeeded in doing so, but nevertheless, the, um, the effort was very successful. We brought in enough money to not only make the prize exciting, but also to fund some of this research that happened thereafter. Yeah. Yeah. So were there, I love how you were so creative with that. Were there any interesting studies that came out of that? Um, well, interesting, yes, but I think the important thing to remember is that there are many research areas that don't scale. You might be able to make a small advance in a particular field and make um, you know, a small increment in lifespan, but those increments may reach diminishing returns. And we believe that most of the work that most people in gerontology and the biology of aging are doing are like that. They're not really going to achieve very much more than they've already achieved. Right. And, and what they've already achieved is quite impressive in mice and, rats and even more impressive in certain really short-lived organisms. But it's really very unimpressive in longer-lived organisms like monkeys, for example, let alone humans. So we believe that it's misleading to suggest that the things that have been at the forefront of progress so far are necessarily going to be at the forefront in the future. And our approach, the sense approach, the damage repair approach in particular, is something that has not delivered any results yet in terms of longevity, precisely because it's a divide and conquer approach. It's an approach in which you have to develop a lot of different things and put them all together in the same organism in order to have any expectation of significant benefit. We're, we're a long way from that at this point. Yeah, yeah. Have there been any study done with mice that you've seen has been a huge milestone for science and has helped with your research? Well, sure. Um, I mean, we do a lot of our own research with mice. Yeah. Mice, of course, have been used in the laboratory for a century uh, in all manner of ways. And in particular, there are lots of techniques out there now for manipulating mice genetically so that one can make them more human-like, uh, make them... For example, mice don't normally get atherosclerosis at all, or Alzheimer's disease, for example. But you can make them... Something that's very like atherosclerosis or Alzheimer's by messing around with their genes. And there are many other techniques available. So sure, there are good, there are important discoveries made all the time. We, for example, have shown that you can maintain the blood of mice even if their blood stem cells are not able to divide indefinitely because they don't have the gene for an enzyme called telomerase that extends the end of the chromosome. Yeah. That's a very important discovery because it's an important component of our approach to combating cancer. Yeah, yeah. 
What, um, Aubrey, what do you think is the hardest part about your job? My job is actually relatively easy. I just, you know, I go on camera, I go on stage, <laughs> I talk about stuff. I, I basically just do the same as I've always been doing. The, re- the people whose job is really hard yeah. are the scientists, people who actually have to grind away at the bench. The thing, is, the thing about research is it doesn't usually work. No, you do it. You have to. You have to refine an experiment and redo it and do it again, yeah. dozens of times before you really get it working properly and informatively, and that's extremely frustrating. I really admire people who can do that. So, is there an avenue for them to vent at you, like to just call and just scream, or like how do they? Because you're you're working on such big stuff, and I could see they just want it to work. How do they vent? Well, of course, they can vent at each other, um, but, uh, but, but also, I mean, of course, that's part of the training in science. In fact, it's probably the most important aspect of scientific training is to understand how to cope with the frustration right. of the, um, you know, the unreliable rate of progress of, of research. What do you find or what do they s- express as the biggest challenge uh, with the research that you're doing? Well, I mean, all research has the same kind of challenges. The technology is just like it's in development. That's why it's called research. Yeah. Einstein had a quote that said, it wouldn't be called research if we knew what we were doing. Um, and, it, that, and that's the honest truth. So no one answer to that question. It's just the nature of the process. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think a, a challenge I see with this is, you know, it requires a lot of funding. You know, you're competing against huge pharmaceutical companies that, you know, get millions and millions and millions of dollars. What's a f- the effective way for you to raise money for the this important research? The big difficulty that we have is that we are working on early stage research. And of course, the we're working on it, the reason we exist at all is precisely the problem you raised there, that most really early stage research gets neglected by other people yeah. because it won't make anyone any money anytime soon, right. and it might not make anyone any money ever. Right. So we want to step into that gap and make sure that vital research that needs to be done is not neglected. And the result is that we decided to create ourselves as a charity, as a 501c3, a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that we would be able to attract funds purely philanthropically. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not to say that we're not interested in the private sector. On the contrary, we regard our mission as, in the long term, to create a rejuvenation biotechnology industry. And what that means is, of course, creating intellectual property, spinning out projects, that we've worked on, just as the just like the atherosclerosis one I mentioned a moment ago, and you know, getting getting it out there to people who are not so philanthropically inclined and who want to actually make a profit in reasonably short order. Um, but yeah, ultimately, the engine room of all of that is the early start, and that's why we are a non-profit now, and that's why we hope to persuade people to understand that they will eventually gain whether in a humanitarian capacity or in a financial capacity, if they are willing to be purely philanthropic at the outset. Yeah. I mean, in, in Aubrey, there's still a lot of competing factors with that. I mean, there's a lot of charities out there. How do you compete with all the other noise of what people can you know, put their funds? Every charity is different. So in biomedical research, there are charities that work on specific diseases and many of those charities are far larger than us, of course. It's somehow an easier sell to talk to someone whose mother died of Alzheimer's and get them to give money to, um, right. to Alzheimer's research, for example. The big problem we have is that society, since the dawn of time, has felt that aging is not really like a disease. It's this kind of natural thing that's just going to happen. Yeah. And they don't really have it in their mindset, the idea that it might even in principle be open to, be amenable to medical intervention. Yeah. That's what we have to The challenge we have is to get, the, get people to understand that actually 
there is no biological basis for making a distinction between things we call aging itself and things we call the diseases of old age. Yeah. How did you end up getting funding from Peter Thiel? We got funding from Peter because I met him at TED, actually, at the, at the TED conference when I was speaking, and we just, he just decided he was interested. Um, I went to dinner with him once, uh, uh, with a few other people. After that, I met him one-on-one -on -one for coffee a few times, just got him up to speed. He just basically just liked the idea. Yeah. You can't do that with Peter Thiel anymore. His philanthropic and, uh, um, um, uh, uh, portfolio has become far too large for that, so he delegates these things now. He has a foundation, of course. Yeah. But back then, it was just him making his own decisions, and I felt extremely privileged to have been able to become one of his most prominent and most, um, well, and, and, and earliest uh, beneficiary. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious, how did you come up with the term SENS? Uh, yeah, okay, so SENS is an acronym for Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence. Yeah. which is a hell of a mouth, and we never really <laughs> accept it. I mean, ultimately, it's not really very important. But it has a bit of etymology. The phrase negligible senescence was already fami a familiar one in the gerontology world. It simply means um, uh, aging so slowly that one can't form a statistically significant conclusion that the population is aging at all. Mm. And this is uh, defined on natural populations, typically. So, of course, the idea of engineered negligible senescence is to turn a species that clearly does age, namely, eventually humans, into one that ages at all, cannot, uh, ages so slowly that you can't tell whether it's aging or not. Yeah. Did you find that in your research? Because I was reading somewhere, it's sort of like an obscure term for like lobsters or crabs that, that don't age. Did you just find it in your natural path or how did you even come across it? Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, I've been working in, I, I spent my first five years in the field of gerontology, just, you know, going to conferences, reading literature, um, getting to know everybody. So yes, it was a term that was very familiar to me by the time I came up with the basic concept that yeah. comprehensive damage repair might be the easiest way to bring aging under medical control. Yeah. So, Aubrey, what would surprise people about your health regimen? Well, I'm not sure that if you look closely at my health regimen, there's anything really surprising because, yes, I don't look after myself particularly well. I definitely don't get enough sleep. Uh, but that's not surprising because I'm on a mission. Right. You know? I've got I've I've got higher priorities, so to speak. I don't really think about it very much. What's typical sleep? A night of sleep for you? There's no such thing. I I'm I'm going to have to get on a red eye tonight, for example. Yeah, I, I'm just curious because um, you see the longevity, so you can do whatever you want, right? Well, in the, in the end, yes. At the moment, of course, is to, um, is to not just um, uh, get to there, but, but, but to get everybody else to there. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back and see where this all came from. And, you know, you're from London. What was it like growing up for you? My childhood was pretty normal. You know, I went to school. I to university. Uh, I was brought up on, uh, by my mother on her own uh, as, as an only child, so I had no, no, no family to speak of. Um, but yeah, it wasn't very interesting. I think that is interesting, actually. What, how did your mom influence you early on? Oh, enormously. I mean, um, she somehow or other got me to enjoy learning and understanding things. And of course, that's the ultimate most important thing for a young child to have in order to make the most of their education. Yeah. What did your mom do early on? Um, well, she was, she, she was left enough money by her parents that she didn't need to work, uh, but she was basically an artist. She painted, she took photographs, things like that. Nice. 
Yeah, sorry, there's a bit of a delay, so I may shut off my video. Um, so if I'm not responding right away, I'm not being rude. I just, okay. uh, there's a bit of a delay there. But um, so the early days, I know you were, uh, what's that? Hey, should I shut it too? Uh -huh. um, let's try shutting it off for a second. Shall I shut my video off too? Yeah, just try shutting it off because uh, I want to be able to hear what you're saying. And um, But I was, I was looking through and um, I want to hear about your experience as an artificial intelligent software engineer. What did you, what were you working on? in those days at Sinclair? Yeah, sure. So actually, I was only at Sinclair for about nine months. Okay. I was, in fact, the last engineer to be taken on by Sinclair. But, but it was during that period that I began the project that I continued working on for the next five years. Um, it was a project in the field of software verification, which is basically trying to cre create programs that find mistakes in other programs. Mm. And I basically went and revisited an approach to software verification that had been abandoned maybe 10 years previously because it was thought to be computationally intractable. Mm. I realized that people had been over-pessimistic in their abandonment because they had been using computers that were so slow and that with slightly faster computers you could look at new questions and I basically came into that at the right time and was able to really rewrite the textbooks and show that actually people had been drastically over pessimistic and wanted to hmm. do far more in this area than people had thought. Yeah, because back in those days that was cutting edge stuff. I mean we're talking in the in the late eighties, right? That's right. Yeah. So then what did you do after you said that kind of spawned you to um, continue on. What did you do after Sinclair? Right. So, <clears throat> so I, as I say, after Sinclair folded, which was in 1986, I carried on for the next five years working on this in a company that was just me and one other guy from Sinclair. The other guy was essentially going out and doing contract programming to pay the bills, and I was just doing full-time research on this project. Mm. But we ran out of money eventually, and by that time I had met my wife. Mm. who is a geneticist. Yeah. Uh, and through her, I'd obviously learned a lot of biology by accident over the dinner table. Um, <laughs> and the result was I was in a good position to take a job at the University of Cambridge in 1992, which happened to open up just at the right time. Uh, it was a job in bioinformatics, working on a database of actually my wife's speciality, fruit fly genetics. Right. Um, it was under the um, tutelage, so to speak, the auspices of a professor at the Department of Genetics who was an old friend of my wife's and in fact my, he, my wife was also working for him at that time. Um, and I worked in that job for 14 years actually, from yeah. 1992 through to 2006. I, I took the job because it was very undemanding, very easy and it gave me time to start thinking about new artificial intelligence projects. Yeah. And that's what I did for a couple of years, but around 1994-95 I started to realize that I wanted to move into aging research because mm. I had discovered that biologists that I was meeting, my wife and other people, were not really interested in aging and I didn't understand why that should be. <laughs> and eventually I thought I could make a contribution, so I decided to switch fields. Yeah, yeah. I was reading that you were in charge of the fly-based genetic database for years and years. Why do you think they were not interested in aging? Biologists, by and large, were not interested in aging because they saw it as decay, and they thought, "Well, we're not going to make, we're not going to find out any fundamental truths about biology by studying decay." Mm -hmm. And to a large extent, that's true. Ultimately, the main reason to study aging is not in order to understand aging. The main reason to study it is in order to be able to do something about it. Right. In other words, to actually be translational rather than just curios curiosity-driven basic research. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, because aging is so complicated, uh, by that time, people had basically got into a mode of thinking, well, it's just far too complicated to really understand well enough to be able to do anything about it medically. So it's not very interesting at all. It's not interesting medically, and it's all right. interesting science. Um, and I, I, I was horrified by this. I thought that absolutely, however hard it is, since it's after all the number one killer in the world right. by some distance, um, it's something that we need to be working on. 
Right. And, um, you know, of course, now things are a little bit better. There are quite a lot of biologists who are quite interested in aging, but it's still not nearly interesting enough to most biologists. Yeah. So after you decide, okay, I'm going to switch from the artificial intelligence to the aging, what'd you do next? Well, for the first five years or so of my interest in aging, I was just learning. Yeah. I mean, I was publishing as well, but the things I was publishing were hypotheses to explain other people's data better than they had explained it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, make new make new ideas of mechanisms of how certain aspects of biology and aging worked. Um, and I was going to conferences all the time and meeting people and generally getting knowledge of various aspects of the field. And then in the year 2000, I had this big kind of eureka moment where I realized that people had been overlooking the possibility of doing damage repair in a comprehensive way to combat aging. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, the reason why it had been overlooked is because a lot of the required techniques, technologies that would be, would be needed to actually make this a, a viable approach were techniques that most gerontologists didn't know about because they'd been developed by other people for other reasons. Mm, I gotcha. To address, um, you know, childhood diseases, for example, or even, so, in some cases, not even biomedical at all. So this business I mentioned earlier of this bacterial approach to combating atherosclerosis, that actually comes from environmental decontamination from a field bioremediation where bacteria are used to clean up pollutants. Yeah. Wow. So, you know... When I talked to David Kekich, he was telling me about the meeting of the minds of the Manhattan Beach Project. What was it like in the room, and what were some of the breakthroughs? Right. So that okay. So David may have been referring to one of two different meetings. Mm -hmm. The meeting that he may have been referring to happened in two thousand, and it was the meeting at which I had this major major eureka moment. Mm. It was a two day invitation only round table with only maybe a dozen people. Yeah. And one of those people, George Roth, was actually the person who came up with the term Manhattan Beach Project because the meeting was happening in a hotel in Manhattan Beach. Right. Um, but actually, for me, the meeting was very strange. Um, the first day of the meeting, basically nobody said anything remotely interesting. It was really disappointing to me. <laughs> think anything. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I was very frustrated. And I was jet lagged because I'd flown in from England and this was in Los Angeles. Right. Um, and so I was awake in the middle of the night. And I was pacing up and down and thinking and thinking. And I, re I suddenly realized this whole concept. And the second day, um, I came down to the meeting room an hour early and kind of drew a big, drew, drew a kind of chart, a kind of table mm -hmm. um, to illustrate my idea. And I asked the person who was chairing the meeting, someone who was working for Dave, uh, if I could present this briefly at the beginning of the day, so as a, as a topic for discussion. And, that, and they said that was fine, and so that's what I did. And nobody understood a word that I said. It was completely hopeless. It took, it took me a while to figure out the right language to use to, 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 you know, to bridge the conceptual gap, so to speak. Why didn't they understand what you said? You have a bunch of bright minds in there. What, uh, what was it? This is normal in science. Yeah. The, the, w w when you have a new idea, the reason why nobody has had it before is because it's outside the box, right? right. It's, because yeah. it's, um, it's just uh, somehow orthogonal to people's pre-existing mindset. Yeah. And so it's normal for people to, take, uh, to, 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 to find it quite difficult to explain to each other however bright everybody is. Mm -hmm. What was it that you presented at that moment and how has it changed? Basically, I just presented this classification of different types of damage, different types of things that change throughout life mm. in the body and that eventually are bad for us. And actually, the classification has changed incredibly little. Mm. Um, and nor have the, and, and also the, 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 the actual changes in um, uh, the, the actual therapies that we want to um, develop to repair these various types of damage. Those have also changed very little indeed. If you go back to my earliest papers in this area, you'll find that I gender, generally talked about nine different types of damage instead of seven. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 
uh, that was just for the first couple of years. I drew away from that because I realized that two of the types of damage could more easily and more usefully be described in terms of the other seven. Um, uh, so, so, but, but it's been the same seven since 2003, 2004. Mm, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not just amazing. It's actually really heartening. It means that the whole thing, the whole paradigm is massively standing the test of time. It means that we are actually, you know, um, on the right track with high probability. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, Aubrey, how is, um, obviously, your wife has been in the field for a long time. How has her thoughts and research influenced your company? Um, well, she's been an enormous influence. Of course, early on, she was the person who answered all my questions about biology, mm -hmm. um, and general, not just about the about biology itself, but about how scientists think. You know, I went when I started inter interacting with professional biologists myself in the field. Um, I knew how to talk to them. You yeah. know, I knew how to be understood and how to be respected. Um, she was also, of course, extremely useful in critiquing my work early on, you know, making sure that when I wrote manuscripts that yeah. they were going to be well received by reviewers, things like that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been enormously important. And over the years, as my ideas have crystallized and gone forward, she's become very um, much more positive about the whole thing. She understands the importance of the mission I'm on. She understands that I have realistic and, um, uh, you know, well thought out ideas. So, yes. She's definitely proud of me. Yeah. I find that uh, wives give completely honest feedback. So I was curious what, uh, what uh, she has to say along the, along the journey. Yeah, that's basically what she had to yeah. say. She, yeah. from not understanding why it was an important problem to understanding that it was an important problem to understanding that I was proposing a viable solution and so on. Yeah. So what... Um, what do you consider some of the big milestones that you are proud of with uh, the SENS Research Foundation so far? Well, um, just getting the research going at all was a, was a major, yeah. you know, bringing money in with the prizes that we started at the Methuselah Foundation to a level that allowed us to start research. That was big. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, scientific breakthroughs are the ones that matter the most. The one I mentioned um, about atherosclerosis is definitely one of the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. More recently, um, in the past less than a year ago, we um, were able to um, demonstrate that we could break down the molecular garbage that accumulates in the heart and causes it is the major cause of death of extremely old people people over the age of 105 110 mm -hmm. um uh, we've made various more esoteric breakthroughs um for example there's um one type of damage we're working on which is the accumulation of mutations in the mitochondria these parts of the cell that do the chemistry of breathing mm -hmm. and um the, the, the approach that we're pursuing was first uh, proposed about 30 years ago, but basically people gave up on it, and we have revived it, and we're much closer to making it work than anybody else is. That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. What are you most excited about for the future? What do you see in the next, you know, five, ten years or beyond? Well, I would say that over the next five or ten years, the future is looking pretty bright. It's still really hard work just bringing money in the door sufficiently to be able to get the work done. But every little breakthrough we make increases our credibility, increases the credibility of the overall paradigm. It makes it that much easier to bring in more money to accelerate. And we're seeing that acceleration. We're not seeing it to a nearly sufficient degree, but we're still seeing it. So, you know, it could be worse. Yeah. Of course, it's not just what we're doing ourselves. It's also the community out there, the, the, the whole zeitgeist of the anti-aging concept. It's no longer considered to be snake oil and snake oil forever. Mm -hmm. There are really respected people like Google getting into this, you know, creating a new company called Calico mm -hmm. that is to defeat aging. And uh, really larger-than-life uh, visionaries like Craig Venter and Peter Diamandis getting together to form a company to try to defeat aging and so on. Yeah. You know, so it's a different world now than it was a few years ago, and I'm hoping that that change is going to accelerate. 
Yeah. What do you? What are the biggest objections that people give you? Well, it depends on what you mean by biggest, doesn't it? I mean, all the objections are pathetic. That's for sure. <laughs> um, like I was watching an interview with you that you did it with BBC. Now, I don't know if he meant to be confrontational or if you even felt he was being confrontational, but he was definitely challenging every point along the way. I think you must be talking about the interview I did with Stephen Sacker. I've done many interviews on the BBC, of course. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, um, well, yes, absolutely. Hard talk is... Uh, has Hard talk, yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to be a um, you know, an adversarial format. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that is Stephen's style. But, um, yeah, I mean... Um, he was a big supporter. You know, I met him just a couple of months before that interview in Switzerland when um, I, I, I think I had to, re I, I was a last minute replacement for the foreign minister of the Lebanon or something like that, nice. or Palestine, that's right, um, uh, at this conference in Switzerland. And he was supposed to be interviewing this politician and he had to switch at the last minute to interview a biologist. And I must say he did rather well. Yeah. But the thing is here, he and, I, he, he, he and I got on like a house on fire, and um, he was very impressed with what I had to say and very interested, and so he immediately put me on his show. And, um, yeah, I mean, he was very supportive. He, uh, obviously, as you say, he um, tried to ask hard questions, but he wasn't particularly surprised that I had good answers, put it like that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so what has been, you know, I know you say your job is easy. I think you're being modest. What is the biggest challenge now for, for you in particular to get the word out? Well, it's all about bringing money in the door. Let yeah. me be clear about that. When I started out, I had three problems to solve. Yeah. And I solved two of them comprehensively at least 10 years ago. The first problem was to come up with a plan for actually defeating aging, actually bringing aging under medical control. And that yeah. was really done in one moment, in the uh, eureka moment I mentioned, 15 years ago. Yeah. And then the second problem was to bring people on board to get the world-leading scientists, yes. or some of them, in all of the various relevant disciplines to be enthusiastic about all of this and to be interested in actually developing these technologies that I was describing. And that, too, was something that I was very successful very quickly in achieving. I would say certainly by 2005, all of the boxes had been ticked in that regard. Hmm. So the only problem that remains is giving those enthusiastic world-leading scientists the resources with which to actually get on with it. Right. And that's still doing. Yeah. You know, Aubrey, I always ask, is, since it's Inspired Insider, what's been the lowest point in your life and how you push through those tough times? I've been extraordinarily lucky in that regard. So, for example, when I was doing um, the software verification work in my mid-20s, I was working in a very unusual way. I'd never worked in research before. Yeah. And I was feeling my own way through this very, very difficult project without a supervisor. Normally, at that stage of a researcher's career, they're doing a PhD. And they've got some senior scientist, a professor, mm -hmm. who's in charge of keeping them on track, keeping them motivated, making sure they don't um, make too many mistakes and so on. I didn't have any of that. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I regard myself as emotionally a very strong individual, but nevertheless, I think I could easily have ended up just becoming disillusioned and deciding that I wasn't cut out for research mm -hmm. if I hadn't just had a bit of luck in terms of a nice steady sequence of, um, of, of achievements, of progress in getting my um, system that I was developing to achieve more and more, to, to be able to do more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, m most research, most PhDs aren't like that. There'll be a period of maybe six months or even longer where one makes no progress whatsoever. And it's extraordinarily disillusioning. Yeah. So I just didn't have that. And in fact, in general, if I look back at my whole life, it's just been rather charmed. You know, everything's gone right. Everything? <laughs> Absolutely everything. Wow. Pretty much, yeah. That's I mean, amazing. You know, I can't look at, I can't, I, I, I can't say that I've had any major setbacks. Yeah, that's, that's, that is amazing. What's been, you know, there's been a lot of proud moments, I'm sure, with, with Sens. Is there one in particular that, that sticks out that you know this is going to be the, the turning point to the big breakthrough? Mm, well, I can think of two, I would say. The first one would, would be the first conference that I ran in 2003. Mm -hmm. 
So that was when uh, the Methuselah Foundation had just been created. In fact, I started, I started to plan the conference before the Methuselah Foundation had been created. And it was a spectacular success. It yeah. was, you know, I'd never run a conference before. Uh, I brought in a huge number of really high-powered scientists. Everyone was astonished at how successful it was. Mm. Everyone loved it. And, of course, it led to, it, it spawned an entire series of conferences that's happened every two years ever since. Wow. Um, so that was, that was good. Um, the second one was bringing Peter Thiel on board as a major donor. Yeah. And that was rather different because there I felt the same. I felt at the time that I really, you know, I really cracked this. I'm going to, it's going to be easy from now on to continue to bring in new high net worth individuals to support this work just as enthusiastically as Peter is doing. Mm -hmm. And there, I was completely wrong. It took another four years before we brought in anyone at the same kind of level oh. as, as Peter. And, you know, we're still waiting for number three. Hmm. It's been at all easy to bring in the right people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who are your mentors? And what's the, the best advice they've given you? I can't really say that I've had any mentors since I was a kid. I had certain very good school teachers, and of course I mentioned my mother already as someone who, you know, had an enormous influence just by teaching me to enjoy learning. Uh, my wife has certainly been important in teaching me a bunch of biology. But if I'm talking about advice, it's rather, it's rather more difficult. I would, I would rather answer the question, who are my role models? Sure. Who do I really look to as yeah. people whose footsteps I'm trying to follow? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and there, I guess, there are a few people I would mention. One of them is Denham Harmon, who just died quite recently, less than a year ago, oh. um, at the age of, I think, 98. He was the originator of the free radical theory of aging back in the mid-50s. Mm. And, um, you know, very, very important gerontologist throughout the history of the field. Yeah. But the point is that he was also a great firebrand in terms of, you know, being unwilling to, 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 to just do what was politically expedient. Most gerontologists in the 60s and 70s, especially the 70s um, and 80s, uh, essentially gave up not only on trying to do something about aging and develop therapies, but also on trying to talk about doing something about aging as the, as the ultimate goal of the field, because it was considered to be politically incorrect. Hmm. Uh, it was considered to be you know, unrealistic and to, bring, you know, to, be, to be counterproductive to funding and so on. Harmon didn't have, Harmon had wanted nothing to do with that kind of thinking. And um, so he actually quit the main um, society for gerontology in America and created his own society, the American Aging Association, in 1970 and brought together people who were willing to be courageous and intervention friendly, if you like. Mm. Um, and that society actually struggled quite a lot for a while because really? so. So few of the prestigious gerontologists in the field were willing to be associated with that kind of thinking. Hmm. These days, it's it's really burgeoning. It's 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 a massive success that society, but it took a long time. Yeah. Then who else would I look up to? I would say certainly Mike West. Mike West is a gerontologist who started out um, in a conventional academic. Um, career, you know, did a PhD and so on, yeah. but who um, then founded a company uh, named Geron looking at ways to defeat aging. Hmm. He, was in, he, he focused on one particular thing, the telomere, the ends of chromosomes. Mm -hmm. um, later on, he moved on to stem cells, especially embryonic stem cells. Um, he's, now been, he's now spearheaded three different companies, all of, who, all of which have made enormous contributions to the field. And so I really look up to him because he's just as committed as I am to the mission, mm -hmm. absolutely, but he's got something that I really don't have, which is commercial acumen. He understands how to actually make investors happy and get stuff done, mm -hmm. even if it's really quite long-term visionary stuff. Yeah. And the third person I would, I would identify as a real role model for myself is, again, for, for similar reasons to Mike West, is Peter Diamandis, mm -hmm. the guy who created the XPRIZE Foundation, yeah. with, you know, the XPRIZE for Space Tourism, and he's since, of course, created many other prizes within that foundation. He's also um, 
uh, created Singularity University jointly with Ray Kurzweil. He's created Human Longevity Inc. recently with um, Craig Venter. He's even working on mining asteroids with planetary resources. So right. he's absolutely everywhere. Yeah. And all of these things he's worked on have been absolutely extraordinarily hard to, to, to succeed with. Yes. He's, he's taken in immense risks. Yeah. So I, I don't know anyone who, com, who, who has his level of combining, on the one hand, real vision and yet, you know, realistic vision, with, on the other hand, salesmanship. He can sell anything. Hmm. And that's why he's managed to do so much. Yeah. Yeah, Aubrey, I asked the mentor question because what I find interesting about um, the Sense Research Foundation site is you do an amazing job of, you have these, the, of a leadership team. Like, you'll have the, you know, the research advisory board and you'll have a team of scientists that way. But then you have also on the technology side, you have... Uh, a group of people on that side, and then the executive team. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of what you got to have for an organization that's doing such a such a lot. And yeah. uh, didn't have that until fairly recently. Um, you know, until let's say three years ago, hmm. uh, our budget was much smaller. It was only in the region of one or two million, and that's because uh, I was able to. I, well, I, I was able to roughly double the budget of the foundation with my inheritance. My mother died in 2011, and mm, sorry to hear that. Left me a, left me a couple of houses in central London, yeah. uh, um, which allowed me to, uh, uh, to, to to basically liqu after liquidating them to have something in the region of um, 16 or 17 million dollars to play with, and I gave more than three quarters of it to the charity, oh. which um, on the one hand. Um, Saved an enormous amount of inheritance tax, as you can imagine. Uh, but, right. So, of course, it did actually allow us to do a lot of projects that we um, 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 that we wouldn't otherwise have, have been able to do. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that was that, that was very valuable. Uh, but yeah, it meant that, of course, um, we didn't have much money early on, so we've been able to do a lot more lately. So, when you put that amount of influx of funds in, what do you do first? You know, you put you know, tens of millions in and you double the budget, where do you decide that the priority is? It seems like a tough decision. Um, well, I mean, of course, I'm the chief science officer of the foundation. So yeah. I was already doing that. I was yeah. already ma making decisions about prioritizing a project. It was just a question of, you know, we were able to move the pay line down and, and fund some projects that we wouldn't otherwise have been able to fund. Yeah, yeah. You know, Aubrey, I appreciate your time, and I have one last question for you, but before I ask it, can you uh, just tell people where they should check out more and find out what you're doing um, at the SENS.org lately? Sure, yes. SENS.org, our website, S for sugar, E for elephant, N for November, S for sugar, no E at the end, just SENS without an E at the end. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's our website, and it's it's got everything you could possibly want to know. It's written. It's got material for... Um, specialists for, te for technical people. It's got, of course, lots of material for non-specialists. It talks about the conference that we're doing in a couple of months in the just just next to San Francisco Airport, um, which will be a, a showcasing of not only academic work but also the industry involvement in this whole new field. Mm -hmm. There'll be regulatory people, there'll be policy people, there'll be everyone, you know, lots of members of the general public, of course. So that would be a definitely the right place to go if one really wants to learn more and get exposed to all of this. Um, and, of course, on the website, there's a nice big friendly donate button. Yes. <laughs> it's in orange. It is. Um, what's the conference called, and is it always in San Francisco? The conference is called Rejuvenation Biotechnology, okay. and it's actually just south of San Francisco. The airport is about 20, 30 miles south of the city. Um, it's always, it, we, we, this is the second one we've done in the U.S. We've okay. done in, in England, which is where I come from originally, of course, and we'll probably continue that series, so it's somewhat on hold at the moment. Um, but at the moment, we're talking about conferences in California, yes, and the, the, the one that's coming up is on, on August 19th through 21st and of course one can register at our website yeah so you know aubrey the last question i had is you know you do a lot of interviews a lot of speaking um what's a question you wish you were asked that you don't get asked often or a conversation that you wish like this interview would would enter into more so you could talk about it 
Well, well, actually, that's quite a hard question to answer because I'm a sufficiently experienced interviewee that I basically yeah. just say what I, whatever the hell you are. <laughs> so I don't have to wish that someone would ask something. I'll just answer it anyway. Yeah, I'm just curious if there's anything top of mind now these days that uh, you know you're most interested yeah. in or most excited about. Yeah, no, not really. I mean, really, the thing, the, the things that are most on my mind with regard to um, the topics that come up in interviews is more what I'm depressed about rather than what I'm mm. excited about. What are you depressed Nam about? Namely, that most interviews, and I commend you for not being one of these people, um, most interviewers will be fixated on talking about supposed hypothetical problems that might be created as a result of, as a side effect of solving the problem we have today, the problem of aging. Right. And... Of course, I've been answering those questions since the dawn of time, and <laughs> right. it's extremely tedious because the answers are so bleeding obvious, and yet the questions still keep coming back because people just don't want to hear the answers. Well, you think they're just scared of death, or what do you think it is? Well, kind of. I mean, of course, when you've had this thing, this horrible phenomenon that's been happening, not just the death, of course, but all the enormous amount of suffering and debilitation and disease and decrepitude and general misery that happens beforehand, yeah. when you've got the thing as a fact of history that's existed since the dawn of time, then you've got to try and find some way to put it out of your mind, really. Um, and that's what people do. They make up these fix fictitious reasons why mm. the uh, things are not important or why aging might be a good thing after all, a blessing in disguise of some kind. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of it is, even though they know that there's progress and some, some crazy people with strange English accents and beards are actually trying to do something about it, <laughs> right. they'll, they'll still, you know, they'll still be scared to get their hopes up, you know, because they'll think they don't want to be in that position of, um, you know, ending up being disappointed if the progress is slower than they were expecting. Now, I, I view that as plain cowardly, but then, you know, most people are cowardly, I guess. Yeah. I mean, w if you think about the question in general, you know, if you just go a little bit deeper, it just is pretty obvious. You know, like if someone says, well, we're going to overpopulate the earth and this or that, you know, well, or it's going to be suffering. Well, the whole point of the, you know, anti-aging is you won't suffer in your old age you know you'll actually be healthier and rejuvenated so i think if you just it's, think beyond the what's that it's not very complicated is it it's pretty right. extraordinary that people fail to get that right or if you know, overpopulating well obviously the people are living longer they're going to be healthy and being actually uh contributing to society and spreading their knowledge even even more um Great. You know, the interview won't be complete, Aubrey, without a beard question, obviously. But, um, you know, when did you start growing this beard and what does your wife think about it? It was about 20 years ago. Wow. It only took two years to get this long. Since then, it's just stayed at equilibrium. Really? Um, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Just like eyebrows, you know, there's some kind of genetically defined <laughs> length that it gets. Um, but when, what does my wife think about it? My wife is the reason why I have it. Okay. I've never grown a beard since I met my wife, which was 26 years ago, uh -huh. 25 and a half, um, and uh, she's a beard fanatic. She campaigned for it. Nice. And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so eventually I had no choice but to say yes. Somehow I knew if, if she didn't like it, it would be gone. <laughs> so. It's worse than that. It's worse <laughs> than that. Um, yeah, even if I even if I were to trim it, she would be apoplectic. I love um, uh, yeah, but I have actually said that I will shave it off for a million dollars, and I have her blessing for that. A million dollars, okay, it's out there. Well, Aubrey, I want to be the first one to thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and everything you're doing. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. bye, -bye. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach if you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand